Amen. That fire is not to shout about. That fire is, is, is when we get too full of the flesh. Amen. The chaff is the husk that covers the wheat. It's what carries the wheat. It's every preacher's personality. Amen. When I preach to you tonight, what I preach to you is going to be, it's going to have the word, but it's also going to have Jim Odo in it. And I need the fire to burn up the Jim Odo part of it so that you can get the word. Amen. So we got to have the fire. That's why we got to have a move of God when a man preaches because it's got to burn the personality out of it and let the true word of God come into the hearts and minds of people. The Bible says that we might receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save us. Amen. No personality is going to save us. Amen. Amen. It's only the good word of God that's going to save us, and I'm thankful for that. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Do you feel the Lord in this house? I feel Jesus in this place. I feel Jesus in this place. I feel Jesus. Find me, AJ. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. He's in this place. And my soul it burns within me. I feel Jesus. He's in this place. Lift your hands and sing it to him. Oh, I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. He's in this place. And my soul does. It burns within me. I feel Jesus. He's in this place. Oh, I feel Jesus, I feel Jesus, I feel Jesus in this place, and my Sold it burns within me. I feel Jesus, He's in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's worship him. If you feel him, just feel after him. If you don't feel him, feel after him. He's not far from any. Come on. Come on, I'm not going to preach until I feel a release to preach. This isn't about me just getting up here talking tonight. I believe that this is a night of appointment. I believe that God wants to do something very specific, very specific, surgical almost tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Come on, come on. I know you know how to do it. Come on, I know you know how to do it. Just let God move right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. This is an apostolic church. This is an apostolic church. We, we, we're going to operate the way the apostles operate. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
I want the intercessors to let the Holy Ghost loose right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God. I believe that God is moving in this city right now. I believe that God is moving in this city, reaching to those that are have lost their way, those that have known the Lord and have known the power of the Holy Ghost and understand the power of the name of Jesus, but somehow or another have lost their way and the Holy Ghost is moving right now through this city. He's going into bar rooms right now. He's going into homes that, that have lost hope and lost sight and God is raising up. Hallelujah, Jesus. I believe there's some people here tonight that have loved ones that are lost tonight and they, they're wondering, will God? I'm telling you, yes, He will. Yes, He will. There are those that are seeking God right now next to a bed crying out to God saying, Lord Jesus, can you restore me? And the answer is yes, He can. Yes, He can. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord, praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's just wait on him. I've got a message, folks. I, I, I'm, I'm not wondering about what I'm going to preach right now. I, I'm just, I don't feel a release to yet. Praise God. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh. Jesus, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. We're here to exalt you, Lord. We didn't come to leave, Lord. We came to seek your face. We didn't come to get out of church. We came to church to have church, Lord. We came to exalt you, Lord. These are they that, that, that have come because it's not convenient, but because they're hungry, Lord. They're hungry for you, Lord Jesus. They're hungry for your presence. They're hungry for your word, Lord God. They're hungry to know you in the power of your resurrection and in the fellowship of your suffering, Lord God. They want to know you. Hallelujah, Jesus. We call upon your name right now, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. Jesus' name, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Holy God, holy God, holy God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name he's master savior jesus like the fragrance after the rain oh Jesus, 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 let all heaven 
and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms shall all pass away but there's something about that name sing it with me come on Jesus stand with me Jesus Jesus there's just something about that name he's master savior Jesus like the fragrance after the rain oh Jesus 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms shall all pass away but there's something about that name Come on, let's praise that name right now. There it is. Oh, Jesus. My Jesus. Oh, there's just something about that name. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Reach over and grab your Bible. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Man, I love Jesus. I love the Lord, and I love to be around people that love the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Some of y'all need to smile. You look like you're going to the dentist's office or something, meeting the parole board or something. It's all right. Come on now. There it is. Some of y'all just grumpy. Amen. God, I love the Lord. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. I can't do this without him, folks. I really can't. I've been doing it for a long time, but I can't do it without him. I won't do it without him. I don't have anything to offer you and myself. My speech and my preaching are not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but demonstration of the Spirit and power. That's what Paul said, and he was a much better preacher than me. And if he couldn't do it without it, I surely can't. So I appreciate you. Entertain in the presence of the Lord with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. I'm going to read a bit of scripture here. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature... Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Everybody say, the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, or to think, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us 
the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of, for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Amen. I want to preach to you for just a little while tonight, the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. Praise God. Lord Jesus, I ask you to touch my lips of clay. Anoint me to speak as the oracle of God tonight. And I pray that you would open our ears to hear, our eyes to see. I pray that you would open our ears to hear that we might receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save us in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise as we are seated. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I am too short for this pulpit. I'm just a tiny fella. Amen. I thought I was average height, but I'm not. I'm short. And I'm not going to stay behind this pulpit, and I'm not going to preach off of any notes. I'm just not going to do it because I can't read and preach and talk and think at the same time. I can barely chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. But I'm going to tell you something. I've got a word for you tonight, church. I've got a word for you tonight because this church is a nail in a sure place. I don't, I don't even think you know fully what God wants to do with you. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that many of you understand how absolutely important each and every one of you are. You're not just some guy sitting on a pew and some lady sitting on a pew coming to listen to a guy talk every week. That's not what this is about. You are a per person of purpose. You were born on purpose. I don't care how insignificant life might have made you feel. I don't care what your mama said or your daddy said or your teacher said or anybody else said. You are not an accident. This is not by chance. You are here tonight with purpose, on purpose, for purpose. Amen? Praise God. Nothing that God does is by accident. Has it ever dawned on you that nothing ever dawns on God? God never turns around and says, well, I wonder how they got here. That doesn't happen with him. He said, for I know the very hairs of your head, and they are numbered. He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I was intimately acquainted with your molecular structure as far as outer space goes, inner space goes. He knows every strand of connecting protein that ties all of the atoms together that make you who you are. He knows all of your quirks. He knows all of your qualities. He knows everything about you. And I want you to process this. Your mistakes were in his process. Ooh. Now, some of y'all don't like that because you want to live by a merit system. And you think if you're really, really good, Jesus is going to like you more. You can't make him like you more and you can't make him like you less. He loves you. He doesn't just like you. He loves you. He has a plan. Now, he can be disappointed in you. He can decide that maybe that ain't quite what I wanted you to do. But I'm going to tell you something. When he looks at you, it is not with a, a downcast look. It's not with the idea that somehow or another you're deficient. Because he doesn't see you as you see you. He sees you through Christ. I'm about to kick some folks' crutches out from under them, Pastor. We're going to get some people employed in the kingdom that have sidelined themselves because you thought you were going to earn your position on this team, but you're not going to earn it. He has called you on purpose for a purpose. Amen. I have a friend. His name is Ron Delda. He was a heroin addict and a heroin dealer in Houston. And he was running from the FBI. 
And unfortunately, he ran into Life Tabernacle, Brother Kilgore's church, when uh, an old preacher, some of y'all probably don't remember, Richard Hurd, he used to preach uh, 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 in time. I got the Holy Ghost, and I thought Jesus was coming back like in an hour. I mean, he scared me so bad, uh, the seat was on fire. You know, bye-bye, backslider, bye-bye, sinner friend, it's rapture. You know, that was, that was what, well, Ron was running from the FBI. They were literally following him, and he, he went and sat. Brother Kilgore's church was fan-shaped like this, and he went and sat on the side. He thought, well, if these fibbies are going to follow me, let them follow me to church. So he sat over there for a while, and they sat in the vestibule, and finally they realized he was going to sit through the service, and they didn't want to, so they left. And he went to get up and leave. And, and of course, Brother uh, 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 Hurd was over here getting ready to torment another sound man, and uh, he was getting prepared, and... Uh, he just walked up to the microphone. He said, if you were thinking about leaving, you might want to reconsider. And he went back to tormenting the sound man. And Ron thought, oh, well, I, best, I guess I better sit down. And he sat down, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost that night. And he was baptized in Jesus' name, and he lived for God for the rest of his life. He, he stuttered. Ron would get to talking to you, and he and then he'd have to change entirely what he was saying to get out of the stutter. But when he preached, he never stuttered. He was a strange fellow. I loved him to death. He, he was, me and him were like me and you. We just clicked. And he, he, he tormented me for years. He was so funny. He'd just call me and mess with me for no reason. But the thing is this. He said he used to call me salty because one time I was salty, the songbook in the kids' play. for the. I, I worked with children's ministry. And he'd say, salty? You know, I thought I came to church by accident. But I realized that God sent those FBI agents to chase me into the church. You see, you might think you got here by accident. But God had a very specific plan. And that plan was reconciliation. You see, reconciliation is not redemption. Reconciliation is not restoration. Reconciliation is accounting. You're reconciling something. You see, we think that forgiveness is reconciliation. But Jesus forgave without any reciprocation, without any connectivity back to those that he was forgiving. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His forgiveness is always ever present forgiveness can be bestowed on someone you can forgive somebody and never you know people say well now brother I, I've been holding a grudge against you and I need to forgive you that's not forgiveness that's, that's passive aggression Bible says forgive it doesn't say you go you, you go to your brother when you were the perpetrator the Bible says if your brother has ought against you you go to your brother, but it says if you have ought against your brother, just forgive him. I don't have to come tell you that you did me wrong. Because half the time you don't even know you did, they did, you know what I'm saying? You're picking a fight where there ain't no fight. They don't even know you were mad. You know why? Because they're not in your head. You're letting them live in your brain for free. He said when you come to the altar and you've got ought against your brother, just let it go. Get over it, man. Forgive them. Free yourself. That's forgiveness. But rest, reconciliation is where I have to come and engage you. you. We have to engage one another. The Bible says to think that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. God became Physically involved in this situation. The eternal spirit of God robed himself in flesh and came to reconcile man to himself. It's a bringing into account. When you reconcile the books, you find out how much money you've really spent. You see, in some of us, when it comes to reconciliation... We think somehow we're going to owe the bill. 
We don't want to, re- we just rather say, well, thank you, Jesus, for the forgiveness, and I'm going to go about my business. But you see, he didn't save you to keep your carcass out of hell. I'd like, you know, we'd like to think that the only reason that we got, sa- you know, that, that he saves us is so that we don't go to hell. But that's not why he saved you. He saved you for use, for a purpose. He wants to operate through your life. He's got a plan. for You know why people backslide, Bishop? They backslide because they have not found purpose in the house. When you look at the story that we call the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal son, it says he was the younger brother. Well, that means a whole lot. Every, listen, every word in the Bible means something. It's there for a reason. God chose Koine Greek because it is a pictorial language. It tells a story. Every word is like a picture and it tells a story. And a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in the King James Version. It's just, you know, it's all them these and thous. Well, you need to understand something. That God also chose the translations of the Bible. And he chose Middle English, which is what the King James is written in, because it too is a descriptive language. And words like reconciliation are used rather than restoration. And when it says thee and thou and thou, those are there for a reason because they have different possessive context. They say, well, there's a bunch of contradictions in the King James Version. You find one and I'll give you 50 bucks. And I mean it. Call me. Look me up. There are none. And when he starts talking about these things, when he says the younger brother, there's a reason it says the younger brother because the younger brother was not going to get the inheritance. Hey, what time y'all get out of here, bro? What time y'all get out of here? I don't want to preach past my time. Okay. Y'all with me still? All right. I believe this is the group that came to church because they like coming to church. So I'm I'm just going to preach to you like that, okay? I don't feel any negativity here. I just don't want to, you know, the mind cannot receive what the seat cannot endure. You know what I'm saying? So the younger brother looks at the situation. He's like, man, I'm not going to lead this household. My future is not in this household. Everybody wants to make this guy out to be some kind of party animal. He wasn't a party animal. He was just an idiot. He was just inexperienced and thought he was more experienced than he was. Which is like most of us when it comes to living for God. We think we're going to tell God what we're going to do. I asked this young brother what he's going to do with his life. He said, man, I have no idea. I'm 17, man. I'm going to school. I appreciate that. You didn't know you were going to be part of the sermon tonight, did you? My God, he's 17 years old. You want him to map his whole life out now? How many of you are doing what you wanted to do when you were 17? I wanted to be a caveman. (laughs) There ain't no way I'm doing that. Seriously, I wanted to be a caveman. I'm not joking. I thought that'd be cool. I'd like to live in a cave. Anyway, that's a whole other sermon altogether. I was was high. What do I know? (laughs) But this young man, he thought, Well, I'm not going to get anything out of this situation. Give me that which is mine. I'm going to go and do my thing. I'm going to go make it happen for myself. And the Bible says that he allocated out what was his and gave it to him. And it says, and as he went on his journey. You see, you need to understand something, folks, that every one of us is on a journey. And you don't have any idea what's ahead of you. And parents, we, we, as parents, we do our best. I told my kids this. I said, guys, I have a daughter that, that, that is, uh, you know, Philip, they came as a package kind of. So I, was, I told him, I said, listen, I have no idea what your life is going to hold for you. But I'm going to try to pack your backpack as best I can for this trip. And I'm going to put a lot of things in there, and you're not going to understand it right now. But you're going to come to things throughout your life and you're going to reach in that backpack and you're going to be like, oh, that's what that's for. So just trust me. I've carried you this far. I've cared for you this long. When you didn't know how to blow your nose, I blew your nose for you. I taught you how to put your britches on and tie your shoes. So trust me. 
And you see, we need to understand something, folks, that, that when we didn't know how to blow our nose, God cared for us. So now that we got a little time under our belt, don't think you're going to start telling him. Oh, come on now. Don't think you're going to start making plans. The Bible says, if you say we're going to go here or there, you better say if the Lord wills, you're going to go here or there. For you know not what tomorrow brings. The Bible says many are the plans of a man, but the purposes of God, they will prevail. God's going to work his work through you. You can do it hard or you can do it easy. He's going to work his work through you. But see, that young man, he thought he was going to go out and do what he wanted to do. And the Bible said he spent it on riotous living. Well, what young man is going to go to the field, and any of you all field guys, you know how it is. They get a pocket full of money, and the first thing they do is go to the wrong place. That's part of the journey. That's part of the life's journey. You make stupid decisions. Play dumb games, get dumb prizes. That's just life, right? That's his journey. But unfortunately for this man, he had misevaluated he had misevaluated the gift that he had. He had misevaluated the benefit of being part of that household. He had misevaluated what that father had given him. And he also was not paying attention to what was going on in the world. And the Bible says a famine arose. It just happened to arise at the wrong time. But the thing that we need to understand is this. That boy ended up in a pig pen in a time of famine. Feeding slop. Well, if there's a famine in the land, where'd the slop come from? And for that matter, why are there pigs left? Because there wasn't a famine in the land, there was a famine in the man. There was something going on in that boy's head. He, he didn't evaluate things properly. He didn't understand the value of things. And what happens is, is we stop understanding the value of things. The Bible says the carnal mind is at enmity with God. You're carnal. You need to understand something. From the moment you wake up, from the time you go to sleep, you are being constantly bombarded with negativity, with things that are contrary to the Word of God, with, with attitudes and ideas and ideologies that feed the carnal mind and starve the spiritual mind. David said, Thy Word, O God, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you're not putting the Scripture into your prayer time, if you're not burying the Word of God in your being, I promise you you're not going to make it. Because you're being bombarded and the carnal mind is constantly at battle with the spiritual mind. And that is where we derive our value system from. I remember a time, Bishop, when we valued things differently. Our time. I applaud you for continuing Sunday night service. Because you ain't going to get more God with less church, sugar. I promise you that. You are not going to get more God with less church. People say, well, yeah, you really need. Yeah, you really need. Yes, you really need. Yes, you do. You need to be in the collective body, in the presence of God. Yes. Folks, I came from a time when I evangelized. We were talking about poor old brother Godwin. He's preached seven times in seven days. I did that a whole lot. For very little, by the way. It wasn't nothing for us to have revivals for months and months and have four or five nights a week. And I'm going to tell you something. They didn't work any less then than we work now. I think I went to meddling. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to being an evangelist and leave off pastoring. And don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Because, see, we, we, we need to evaluate what, what our kids got to be at school. Yes, they got to be at school. But I'm going to tell you something. Our kids need to be in the presence of God. Our kids need to hear what pastor is preaching. I, I, I don't need to listen to my next door neighbor that doesn't have any idea about what church is or what God is or what God thinks. I'm not interested in what this world's opinion of my Savior is. I know him. And I want to be reconciled to him. Why? Because reconciliation balances the books. 
it restores favor with God. It puts me in a position where I find myself to be useful again. Because I'm not being evaluated by the opinion of anybody around me. I'm being evaluated by the ultimate bookkeeper. By the one that holds the books. He's the one that determines my ability and and, and the ability to be fit. Because this is a deal. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what he said. He, He reconciled the world to give the ministry of reconciliation to the church so that you on your job, at your school, wherever you are, you're the one that is saying, no, 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 listen, that's not the way that God looks at you. How do you know? Because I'm a witness. Listen, God didn't ask you to be super smart. He didn't ask you to be perfect. He asked you to be good. And faithful. And that's it. It's not rocket science, man. He didn't ask you to come up with any ideas for planning anybody's future. He said, be a witness. When I need someone to step up to the plate to say, yeah, he'll do it. Yes, he'll do it. You say, Brother Odo, you don't have any idea what my life is like. My life is a wreck. I've made so many bad mistakes. I'm just, man, I'm just, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> oh, man, I wish we had time for a cup of coffee and I could share with you the devastation of Jim Odo, the abject, unadulterated stupidity Of one ball-headed little man. I could tell you stories that would really bother you. But you know what? This book tells me. This book tells me that he's made all things new. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Hey folks, this is written to church folks. This is written to church folks. People say, well, you know, but you came to the Lord and you messed up. Let me tell you something. There is nothing you're going to do so good that you don't need Jesus. And there's nothing you can do so bad that his blood will not reconcile you. He'll make you whole if you'll let him. See, because that's what it's about. See, I'm looking at people right now that used to probably run bus routes or used to witness to people or used to do something. You used to do something. And somehow or another, you talked yourself out of it. You you said maybe we don't need that anymore. Maybe that's not. Listen to me, folks. That is a lie from the devil. That is a poor analysis of the books. You need to to hear this preacher tonight when I tell you that God is calling you to the ministry of reconciliation. You say, I don't know what to say. Well, that's good. I've got good news for you because he's committed unto you the word of reconciliation. So you don't even have to know what. Listen, not only does he give you the opportunity, he gives you the tools to do it. And then he gives you the power to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I mess up your excuse? Well, pardon me. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't see a church sparsely populated. I see an army with banners. I don't see a waning Sunday night service. I see a groundswell. I see a time, Bishop, when, 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 we, when we run out of energy because of the work that the body is doing. I see a time when we say, I'm going to stand and I'm going to go and I'm going to say and I'm going to do. But it's not going to be some preacher doing it. It's going to be an ordinary saint of God in the church that knows his God. The Bible says, and they that do know their God shall be mighty and do exploits. 
Oh, I'd like to believe you, Brother Odo. I'd like to believe you, but, but you see, I've, I've made so many mistakes. And I, I, I've, I've got the landing gear down. I've found the runway. I'm, I'm headed in. The wheels are coming down, and I'm, we're going to land here in a minute. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. God's real big. I promise you, He's strong enough. I promise you, He's capable. And I promise you, He's willing. You see, you need to understand something. That God's grace is shed abroad. But He also has specific grace for you. For you, the Bible says, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. But in all points was tempted like as we. He understands. He he knows. And you see, family problems, family problems, they're family problems. Church problems, they're family problems, they're church problems. There's things, there's problems. Brother Odo, you know, it's just broken. It's just, I, I, I was preaching a couple of weeks ago and, and I went to pray for a lady that I know and I know their family, I know their life and she just fell on my neck and she said, it is so broken. And I said, sister, it's going to be all right. She said, no, no, it's not. And my heart broke. Because I know there's people, you, you come and you hear a preacher preach about a God that can do anything, but then you start thinking about your situation, and you just don't see how God is going to work it out because you're limiting Him to your own understanding. Listen, my friend, it might be all beyond repair, but it is not beyond reconciliation. You may not be able to patch it together, but he can make it new. I want you to let that settle on you. See, you're looking to patch it up. You're looking to fix it, and we're going we're gonna to prop it up. That's not what God does. He doesn't make patch quilts, honey. He doesn't come and piece it together with, with glue and bale and wire. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. He breathes on it. And it's made new. But you see, you got to let go of the future that you had imagined for yourself. And take hold of the future that he had planned from the beginning. There was a woman that came to David. And David, David was bearing the fruit of... Of his adulterous and murderous acts. Nathan told him the sword will not leave your household. And there he was in the midst of it. And his boy. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't have a kid. I would rather everything fall on me. Than to ever touch my children. But that is not the way it works. And you are robbing your children. Of their strength to try to shield them from their journey. The father never went off the porch until the boy started heading home. Because he wasn't going to rob that boy of his journey. That's another message. But David, Absalom has killed his brother He stood and, and, and actually betrayed his father, and he's exiled. He's, he's, he's waged war against his own household. You know why? Because kids are dumb, that's why. They do dumb stuff. People do stupid things. People do dumb things, folks. Did you really think you were going to get out of life without somebody's stupidity slopping up on you? People are reckless and they're, and they're ignorant. And you never even entered their thinking. It ain't nothing personal. They were just rolling in the stupid. And it just splashed up on you. <laughs> we were driving to church and this idiot comes round, round, round. I put my little blinker on and I'm getting over because 
I'm obeying the law. And boom, man, we almost kissed each other. Right there, boom. I pulled out. I didn't even say an angry word, much less a cuss word. Hallelujah, isn't that awesome? But that guy's recklessness almost crashed my vehicle. That's life. And David is here living this public humiliation. And see, really, that's what the problem is more than anything. Are y'all with me still? Have I preached beyond my time? See, see, he's living this public humiliation. And that's the problem with the church. People say, well, I just can't stay, brother. I'm too embarrassed. Really? Well, listen, baby. If you can't fall here, they'll eat you alive out there. This is your family. This is your family. Everybody may not act right all the time, but this is your family. We love you. This is the place to fall. And this little woman comes to him, and and David is in this quandary about whether to let Absalom come back. And he's there, and he's, he's contemplating what to do, what to do. I'm the king, what am I supposed to do? And she says something, it is the most powerful scripture in the Bible to me. Because this is what I needed. She said, for we must needs die and are as water spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, hear me now, Yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. I want to talk to you just for a second about that. If you've got a lost loved one, if you've got a wayward child, a wayward spouse, a wayward father, mother, whatever, I want you to know something, that life is life and it's like water spilled out on the ground. And you can sit down there and try to, try to scrape all the pieces back together and, and put it all back together again. You're not going to get it done, but I'm going to tell you something. We serve a God that right now is working His work and He's making up a way. That they're not forever cast out. He's he's moving them and making a way. You say, brother Odo, it's just it's just too bad. You don't know. They're they're they they don't they they're just they're just so far gone. I'm gonna tell you something. Amos tells us of the good shepherd. Oh, he said he goes out. And he finds that lamb. He looks for that lamb everywhere. He looks high and he looks low. And if he doesn't find anything but a leg and a piece of an ear, he's going to bring it back. And I always thought, why in the world would he bring that back? I'll tell you why. Because we serve the God of the resurrection. And I don't care what's left of your life. I don't care if it's just a leg. And a piece of an ear. If it's something that can get you mobile. And if it's something where you can barely hear. There ain't nothing left but an ear and a leg. He'll put it back together. He can put your love. But but listen to me honey. You're not going to be all gimped up. You're not going to be Frankenstein's monster. He's going to breathe on you. He's going to restore. He's going to reconcile. He's going to, he's going to see where you lack, and he's going to fill in the difference. He said, I'm going to pull every mountain down, and I'm going to exalt every valley. God's going to make a way where there seemeth to be no way. I'm not telling you something that I read in a book somewhere. I'm telling you something that I've experienced. He said, I will restore the years that the locust and the canker worm have devoured. He will put you back. where you need to be stand with me all over this building praise God you see but we know a lot about the one that left but the one that stayed that's the one we think we know a lot about but we really don't because see that story is not the story of a prodigal son it's a story of a lonely father Because neither one of his boys really wanted much to do with him. 
One of them wanted to leave and find his way. And another one wanted to stay and just wait for the old man to die. He said, hey, your brother's back. Come to the party, son. Ah, I'm not coming over there. He said, your boy. He didn't even call him my brother. He said, your son. He took you for a fool, old man. Took all your money. And really what he was saying is, took all my money. Because he was going to inherit everything. He said, I have served you faithfully. And you won't even give me one kid goat that I could make merry with my friends. See, there's a party going on right now that this boy won't go to. Where everybody could enjoy it. But you see, I want to be the one to put the party on. I want it to be my party. You see, what you're doing, sir, ma'am, is you're wanting to take the blessings of God and you're wanting to make your own party. See, there's some people that want to take the righteousness of God and the, and the prestige that comes with it. And the, and the, you know, I mean, you're some squared away folks. Y'all look good. I don't know if you've looked at yourself lately, but y'all are a sharp outfit. And we want to take that, Bishop. And we want to advance our career. And we want to advance our status and distance ourselves from the Father. I, 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 I have to preach this. I know it doesn't apply to anybody. But, I, you know, it goes with the sermon, so I have to preach it. None of y'all. But there's some people that y'all might know. But you see, this is the deal. He said, he said buddy, everything in here is yours. I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's all yours. But your brother, he was dead. And now he's alive. Come on. So this is what I'd say to you tonight, First Church. Come on. Come on. Come down here with me. Come on. Celebrate with me. Because there's restoration, not only for you, not only for yours, but there's some people out here that we don't even know yet that are of the household of faith that God's going to bring into this church. Yes. They're coming. They're coming. And I know you're ready for them. You're not that brother. You're, you're, you've got the heart of the father. And when that father saw him far off, he ran and fell on him. Why? Because the rest of the city would have stoned him. But the Father covered them. This church is a covering church. Come on. This church is a church that loves people, that loves people back in. It's not hell that's going to turn. Listen, those people are living in hell. They know what hell is like. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the love of God that constrains us, right? Isn't that the truth? This is what I want you to do all over this building. And I apologize for preaching so long. I just had to get it off my chest. If you're here tonight and you have a lost loved one or somebody that's been on your heart, the other night I was sleeping and a person from my past that I know loves the Lord was raised up in the church out of nowhere popped up in my mind. I, I, I just rolled right over onto the ground and started praying for him right there. If somebody came to your mind while I was preaching, will you come down here right now? Take an act of faith for them. Move out of where you are and come down here. Because I'm going to tell you something. God's given you the ministry of reconciliation. God's given you the ministry of reconciliation. And this is what He's going to do. I'm going to pray that when you come down here, He's going to give you the word of reconciliation. He's going to give you something to say. And, 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 but this is what I want you to do. I want you to not be afraid. I want you to not be afraid and think that they're so far off that if I say anything, it's going to run. No, listen, you're not going to run them off. The devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. He's given you the word of reconciliation. How many of you are down here thinking about somebody right now? Raise your hand. 
I want you to put your other hand in the air right now. And I want you to say this with me, Lord Jesus. You put them on my heart. Now give me the opportunity and give me the word. And I will witness of your goodness in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for listening to me tonight. God bless you.